Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me in the Betters Box. This is ATS.io's MLB betting podcast for Thursday, May 27th. I'm your host, Adam Burke. Daily article goes up every day over at ATS.io. Lots of stuff in today's write-up. We've got 15 games here today, a couple of double headers. We've got the completion of a suspended game. Lots of things going on on the MLB betting board for today's action. So you can check out that daily article over there at ATS.io. Make sure you download the ATS app as well from the Google Play Store or the Apple Store, a bet tracker, an odd screen, a stats database, lots of stuff in there to help you with your handicapping and your betting. Very powerful resource to have at the palm of your hand, at your fingertips. So download that ATS app today. And over at the website, make sure you check out all of our other content as well. Did a golf preview for you this weekend, got a NASCAR preview up. We'll be doing UFC this afternoon. I've been working a lot on different sports book reviews. we got a post up now about WinBet as they continue to advance across the country. Unibet, also another one that I wrote up here this week. So you can check out those sports book reviews over at ATS.io to go along with all of our picks and predictions and all of our other content. Yeah, we got a holiday weekend here. Holiday coming up on Monday with Memorial Day. Kind of that unofficial start to summer. Uh, this year, obviously, you know things will be a little bit different. More people getting together, doing cookouts and all of that. As far as right now, I still intend to do the show on Monday, despite the holiday. Uh, that is something that I will be looking forward to doing after the weekend. May not do as in-depth and as detailed of an article, depending on the plans that my wife makes for me. And those of you that are married know exactly what I'm talking about. So we'll see what I'm doing on Monday, but we will get something out to you there uh, for the betters box with that Monday show. Probably no matter what, I don't want to make a 100% guarantee, but that is something I anticipate to happen here coming up on Monday. Traditional show here for this Thursday, May 27th edition of the betters box. We'll take a look beyond the box score, go down the lines, give you a pick for tonight's action, and then preview the weekend ahead. So I want to talk a lot about home road splits on today's show, kind of talk about park factors, how those things should be factored into your handicapping. Because as I've taken a look at the betting markets here for this season, as I've looked at totals specifically, paying close attention to those with, you know, obviously a different baseball, as I've talked about at length here so far this season. And I will talk about it for the month of May coming up here on Monday's show. But park factors seem to be being factored in a little bit more this season than we've seen in past seasons with regard to totals. And I also think that to a degree, betters are factoring that in more to side handicapping as well, which I will talk about here in a few minutes. But that deadened baseball is far worse in some places than others, to be sure. And we saw this year, Major League Baseball added five humidors. I believe every retractable roof stadium now has a humidor. I'm not sure if Milwaukee does, but I know Seattle does, Texas does, Houston does all those ballparks with the retractable roof stadiums. And then also some of them like Marlins Park, uh, you know, I think it's also a retractable roof actually. But, you know, some of the other ones that are really extreme pitchers parks, a Marlins Park, uh, Bush Stadium, that's another one that has a humidor now. So we're kind of waiting to see what the impact is of the humidor and the baseball in some of those venues. Although with that being said, four of the no-hitters this year being thrown in Seattle and in Texas where both of those ballparks do incorporate a humidor. Uh, Meredith Wills does a phenomenal job on Twitter at BBL Astrophysics, BBL underscore Astrophysics, taking a look at the baseball, kind of the impacts that it has had. Uh, Obviously, she's been very busy over the last few years here with the changes to the ball and all of that. Those are things that get covered at fan graphs, at the athletic, so on and so forth. But I wanted to look specifically here today at some of the home road splits, at some teams that do very well at home, some teams that do very poorly at home, some teams that do very well on the road, some teams that do very poorly on the road, and then the biggest discrepancies between the two with home road splits, not many of these teams will be all that surprising to you, but this is very important, very helpful handicapping information for a variety of different reasons, and I will tie all of that together once I run through these teams. And of course, as always, a lot of numbers coming your way here in short order. If you want to follow along with the notes while you listen to the show, if you want to look at the notes to sort of, uh, you know, reaffirm and recap what I talked about on the show, you can do that as well. 
but email me skating tripods at gmail.com exactly how you would expect it to be spelled skating tripods at gmail.com that'll get you on the list for the betters box show notes so you can either follow along as you listen or as i said kind of recap and rethink back through some of these different things that i've talked about so as far as the top home teams in Major League Baseball, these are ranked by WOBA, weighted on base average. As you know, my favorite sabermetric stat. Also mentioning the slugging percentage and the WRC+, plus, weighted runs created plus, a metric over at Fangraphs where 100 is league average. And these are league adjusted based on the run environment and also park factor adjusted. So WRC+, plus is a really good statistic to look at for offensive Uh, performance for these teams because it does incorporate both the run environment in the league but then also for the park factor so the top team here in woba at home is the toronto blue jays at 361 a 493 slugging percentage that also leads all of baseball and a 128 wrc plus leads all of baseball however td ballpark and dunedin florida will no longer be Toronto's home ballpark. The Blue Jays will go to Salem Field now in Buffalo beginning June 1st. So on Tuesday, they'll be the home team in Buffalo. So their home offensive numbers will not carry any weight here as we go forward. And what's really interesting about that is, you know, we expected in Florida with the weather conditions, which are very conducive to offense, by the way, even with this dead in baseball you know, that thick, warm, humid air. We saw some games where the wind kind of came into play as well. Toronto was a very, very good home team offensively. Now, what will they do at home at Salem Field back up in Buffalo? Well, last year they were 10th in Woba at home at 343. So they were still a pretty good home offense, 463 slugging percentage. A lot of these numbers much higher last season because the baseball did carry, did travel a little bit better. Toronto was good in Buffalo. The opposition wasn't all that good. So we'll see what happens here now that they move back up to Western New York. But their offensive numbers on the whole, very much skewed by what they did down at their spring training facility in Florida. And I will talk about that again here in a couple of minutes. Next best home team on the board for Woba, the Reds at 357, 483 slugging, a 122 WRC plus so that's 22 percent above league average here offensively at home for the Reds and Great American Ballpark is arguably and by some metrics is one of the best home ballparks for home runs in Major League Baseball so the Reds you know again a team that's very well versed in analytics they're all in on the numbers and the metrics both on the offensive side and also the pitching side They're hitting a lot of fly balls. They're trying to make as much hard contact as possible. And it has paid off at home for Cincinnati here so far, where they do have the second ranked weighted on base average. And as Toronto gets some games in there at Salem Field, I would assume the Reds wind up leading the league in this department. So we'll see if that continues throughout the summer months. As it warms up down in Cincinnati, that ballpark does play quite a bit smaller. So I would anticipate that the Reds continue to be One of the best home teams here offensively. The Braves at 348. They are third. 492 slugging is second in baseball. Will be number one as Toronto's home numbers level off a little bit. The Braves a 118 WRC plus though. So what that tells you is that SunTrust Park down in Atlanta is a very good hitters park. That is accounted for in that WRC plus metric. So yeah, the Braves have done really well offensively there. But the idea is that visiting teams should do pretty well offensively as well, where it's just a very good park for hitting overall. However, with that being said, the Braves and all the fly balls that they hit, they should hit for a lot of power at home. And as it keeps warming up, I would not expect that to change at all whatsoever. Next up is kind of an interesting one here. That's the Houston Astros with a 341 Woba, a 444 slugging percentage, a 127 WRC+. plus. So that's second in baseball in terms of home weighted runs created plus. And that's an indication of the fact that Minute Maid Park is just not a great offensive ballpark. However, early on in the season, it is pretty good because as the roof is open, Minute Maid Park is a very good offensive park. 
as it warms up throughout the summer, it's 90 degrees, 100 degrees. They close the ballpark. They go into that more climate-controlled environment with the air conditioning on, probably gets down in the mid-70s or whatever. Minute Maid Park is not as good of an offensive venue in the summer months as it is when they can have the roof open. Now, of course, with COVID and with fans and capacities and all of that, maybe they just kind of bite the bullet and wind up having the roof open a little bit more frequently in the summertime, kind of deal with the heat, you know, at the expense of public safety and all of that. So that's a development that we'll have to watch very, very closely. But for right now, Houston fourth and Woba at 341. And another reason why this is the case is because Houston just does not strike out. Last night, Trevor Bauer only had three strikeouts. Garrett Cole had a start against Houston earlier on in the year. He only had four punch outs. So Houston has the lowest strikeout percentage at home by far and putting balls in play with great success. I do think that Houston's offensive numbers at home will regress a little bit here as we go forward if that roof is closed. So that is something I think you should factor in to your Astros handicapping here as we go forward. Not surprisingly, but the Rockies are fifth with a 340 weighted on base average, 465 slugging. But with that WRC plus metric, again, adjusted for park factor, they have an 87 WRC plus at home. So the course field park factor is very damning. Obviously, offense is just better across the board in Colorado, to say the least. I've gotten to the point here where I think the course field park factor is kind of evaluated too much into the statistical profile. Maybe it's not accounted for enough on the road and accounted for a little bit too much at home. But as we know here, the Rockies dramatically better at home than they are on the road. Running quickly through the next five teams here, that was the top five, the Blue Jays, Reds, Braves, Astros, and Rockies. The Angels are sixth, 336 Woba, 459 slugging, 118 WRC+. plus. Obviously, without Mike Trout, those numbers will probably go down a little bit here. The Dodgers at 336, but only a 421 slugging percentage, 121 WRC+. plus. Dodger Stadium has played better offensively over the last few years, so the park factor may need to be adjusted a little bit. But one of the big things for the Dodgers here is that they've walked a lot. They haven't hit for as much power as I would expect them to, but they do have a very high walk rate and walks a big component of Woba weighted on base average. So the Dodgers do grade very highly here, even though they're not hitting for as much power as some of these other teams. The Red Sox at 335, 445 slugging, 107 WRC+. plus. The low WRC plus does incorporate the fact that Fenway Park, probably the second best hitters park in all of baseball, small dimensions, you know, it's easy to get hits off the green monster and all of that. So of course the Red Sox very good at home, but with that adjusted park factor, they come down to a 107 WRC plus the White Sox, 329 Woba, 391 slugging percentage, one of the lower slugging percentages and easily the lowest of the top 10 but they've got a high walk rate and they've got that ground ball offensive style where they lead all of baseball and on base percentage at home. So that really helps out their Woba number. So even though they're not hitting for power at home, they are getting on base a ton, scoring a lot of runs at home because of their offensive approach and their offensive philosophy. And lastly, the Diamondbacks, interestingly enough here, 329 Woba, 437 slugging a 106 WRC plus, but of course their numbers falling off a little bit with all of the injuries that they have. So the worst home teams now, and something that's really important to think about, and I was probably going to tie this together at the end, but I will talk about it now, is that you play 81 games at home. You know, you may play at a maximum 10 games at the most in any number of road ballparks. You know, you play 19 division games, you'll wind up playing 10 road games against a few of the teams in your division. So when you play 81 home games, it is very much worth your while to look at whatever it is you need to look at to build your offense to perform at home. It is critically important to be good offensively at home. And these teams that are not good offensively at home have a variety of reasons why. Some of them just play in bad ballparks. Some of them are just not good offenses. So it's always interesting to look at the worst home teams and then compare that to what they do on the road 
to see what the actual talent level is of that offense. And for example here, the worst team at home offensively by far is the Seattle Mariners. A 266 WOBA at home, 322 slugging percentage, 76 WRC+. And the Mariners here, you know, 14 points. They have the lowest WOBA, 12 points, the lowest slugging. T-Mobile Park is not a good offensive park. They've been no hit twice at home already. And also, the Mariners adopted this fly ball heavy style. And while I like that approach, I think it's a good idea. There are two problems with it. One, your home ballpark suppresses power in a big way. And two, Major League Baseball changed the ball on you. So the Mariners here, the worst home team by far offensively, and this will not change. This will not get much better for them. Unless something happens with the ball as the season goes along, this will not get better for them. And obviously, the humidor has not helped at all whatsoever either. This one surprises me quite a bit. Another retractable roof stadium here, and as I said, I presume they put a humidor in here. If they didn't, that'll be in the next round of all parks. But the Brewers, a 280 weighted on base average at home, 334 slugging, 76 WRC+. This used to be a good offensive ballpark, and it's just not right now for the Brewers. And I don't really know why. Uh, You know, I know I'm sure they've had the roof closed a lot because, you know, weather hasn't been that great across the Midwest to this point. But Milwaukee being that bad of an offensive team, really surprising to me. The Indians, 288 Woba, 372 slugging, a 78 WRC+. Now, progressive field actually plays pretty well for power for left-handed hitters as the weather warms up. Now, of course, in April, a lot of cold weather games in Cleveland That's part of this, but the larger part of it is that this offense just isn't very good. So the Indians are 28th in weighted on base average at home. A little bit better in the slugging percentage department. They have hit for some power. They've scored a high percentage of their runs off of home runs, but they're just not a good offensive team at home or on the road. And so they've not performed well at progressive field so far this season. Now the Tampa Bay Rays are really interesting. I'll put the cart in front of the horse here and tell you that the Rays are the best road team offensively in baseball. They're also the fourth worst home team offensively in baseball. A 290 weighted on base average for them, 355 slugging, but a 93 WRC+. plus. So they're only two points higher than the Indians in Woba, but 15 points higher in WRC+. Plus. And that speaks to just how bad of an offensive park Tropicana Field actually is. It's cavernous. The ball doesn't carry well. It's just not a good park for offense. A lot of power suppression at Tropicana Field. So that's where WRC Plus comes into play here, where, yeah, the Rays are not a good offensive team at home, but when you adjust for the league run environment and the park factor, they're only 7% below league average offensively with that park factor as such a big part of the equation. So the Rays are not a good offensive team at home, but they're probably not as bad as the numbers suggest. And also what that suggests is road teams will not be as good offensively at Tropicana Field. So that's why on the road for the Rays, we see totals of eight and a half or nine at home. A similar pitching matchup could be a seven with overjuice or a seven and a half, something like that. So Tropicana Field is just a very, very bad ballpark for offense that's incorporated by WRC+. Plus but not incorporated by WOBA or slugging percentage. So that's why I included that advanced metric in these breakdowns here. The fifth worst team at home is the Marlins. 294 WOBA, 359 slugging, a 96 WRC+. plus. So again, the same story here for the Marlins where their ballpark is just not good for offense. That's reflected in their numbers. But the Marlins are also not a very good offensive team either. Not a ton of talent to that offense. So Not a big surprise that they're in the bottom five here. But again, WRC Plus kind of paints a prettier picture, so to speak, for them. The other worst home teams here, the Rangers, bad park, bad offense. Tigers, bad park, bad offense. Comerica Park is just too big. You know, it's got a great batter's eye. It's a pretty good doubles and triples ballpark, but not a lot of home runs. So that kind of weighs down the slugging percentage a little bit. And the Tigers strike out quite a bit as well. Pirates, another bad offensive ballpark with a bad offensive team. The Cardinals, bad offensive ballpark. And the Mets, not a great offensive ballpark, a lot of injuries for them. 
So the best home teams here by Woba, Blue Jays, Reds, Braves, Astros, Rockies in the top five, Angels, Dodgers, Red Sox, White Sox, Diamondbacks, six through 10. The bottom here, the Mariners, Brewers, Indians, Rays, and Marlins. And then just outside the bottom five, Rangers, Tigers, Pirates, Cardinals, and Mets. Now the best away team here is the Tampa Bay Rays with a 336 Woba. But keep in mind, a 336 Woba would have you tied for fifth as the best home team. So you've got five teams over 336 at home, and the best team on the road is at 336. So this is exactly what I talked about of when you play 81 games at home, you try to tailor your offense as much as you possibly can to that home ballpark. So home numbers are always across the board going to be better than road numbers. You will have some teams that are outliers that are better on the road than at home due in large part to the park factors. But overall, offense from home teams will be better than offense from road teams. And that's really a big reason why home teams are favored as often as they are. Yeah, they get the home field advantage in the last at bat and so on and so forth. But it's simply because you can tailor your offense to your ballpark at home and you cannot really do that on the road. So the thing about the Rays here and why they're the best road team, 336 Woba, 437 slugging, 116 WRC+, plus, they have a good offense. It just doesn't really show up at home. And something else I've talked about, and I talked about this a lot in my Rays season preview, they have two different offensive approaches, whether they're at home or on the road. On the road, they're much more aggressive, a lot more pull side contact, a lot more fly ball percentage. At home, they try to work counts and draw walks and create run scoring opportunities that way because they know that they're not going to hit for as high of a slugging percentage. Again, their slugging percentage on the road, 437. At home, 355. That's an 82-point difference. That is very significant. A lot of it has to do with the park factor, but a lot of it also has to do with Tampa Bay's offensive approach. Next best road team here this season is the Twins at 334. 440 slugging is the highest in baseball, 115 WRC+. plus. Uh, the Twins have been very good away from home. Target Field has some high walls, uh, you know, has some bad weather as well. So those are parts of the equation there for them. But they've been a very good road team here so far this season. White Sox are third, 328 Woba, 413 slugging, 110 WRC+. plus. Their offensive style will play anywhere. They're not really hurt by the home road splits or anything like that. In fact, their Woba is almost equal at home and on the road. Their slugging percentage is a little bit higher on the road. I do think that levels off now that it's getting warmer in the city of Chicago. So I think the White Sox are a very reliable offense, both on the road and at home. So not a big surprise to see their numbers pretty consistent across the board there. The Red Sox, 327 Woba, 446 slugging. That's the highest, so I misspoke. The Twins are second. 110 WRC plus for the Red Sox on the road. So they've been good at home and on the road. And that's not really a big surprise because they're a very talented offense. And also the AL West has a lot of good offensive parks. Tropicana Field is the exception, but obviously the park in Dunedin has been good. Yankee Stadium is good for offense. Camden Yards, good for offense as well. And the, the Red Sox, excuse me, just a very consistent team. So the White Sox and the Red Sox, going to be consistent offensively, whether they're at home or on the road. Number five here is no surprise. The San Francisco Giants, 326 Woba, 437 slugging, 105 WRC+. Oracle Park is not a good offensive park. 2020 was the exception to the rule there. It's not a good offensive ballpark. You got that marine air, usually the cool breeze kind of coming off the bay and all of that. Uh, You know, you just don't have very good hitting conditions in San Francisco. But this is a good offensive team and a team that really changed its offensive philosophy for last season and has carried that over to this season. More fly balls, more pull side contact, all of that. So it's really not surprising at all that the Giants, one of the best road offensive teams here in Major League Baseball. And in fact, they also start off a string here of three California teams The A's are sixth, 324 Woba, 436 slugging, 108 WRC plus. 
And the Dodgers are seventh, 323, 393, 104, the numbers for them. So the Dodgers, a good offense, both at home and on the road. That's not the least bit surprising. But to see Oakland here sixth, and they've been better on the road than at home, that's not surprising either. Oakland Coliseum, not a good park factor. High walls, deeper dimensions, ball doesn't carry all that well. Oakland being a better road offense than a home offense makes a lot of sense here. The Nationals, their eighth, 319 Woba, 405 slugging, 101 WRC+. Plus. The Astros, ninth, 319, 409, 105. And the Rangers, 10th, 315, 397, 102. And again, for the Rangers here, just a bad home park factor. You know, they Globe Life Field is not good for offense. They perform better on the road. That's not a big surprise. But again, when you look at the top 10 teams here, 329 weighted on base average on the at home, excuse me, for the White Sox and the Diamondbacks, 329 would be third on the road. So again, that's a really big point to keep in mind here is that these teams cater their offensive styles to playing at home. So you will get some big home road splits for a lot of these teams based on their philosophy, based on their talent, based on their approach. You'll also get some big home road splits because of the park factors. These are very important things to keep in mind when betting sides or totals in Major League Baseball. So I talked about the top 10 on the road, Rays, Twins, White Sox, Red Sox, Giants, and then A's, Dodgers, Nationals, Astros, Rangers. The worst five teams on the road, well, the Rockies, and that's not the least bit surprising. 255 Woba, 303 slugging, a 59 WRC+. plus. They're 19 points worse than anybody else in Woba, 29 points worse than anybody else in slugging. Their road offense has been pathetic this season. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, look, at Coors Field, a good offensive environment, Pitchers, pitches don't move as much. You know, there's decreased movement because of the lack of resistance on the baseball. It's a very scientific, you know, physics-based approach here. But the Rockies at home, pitches don't move as much. On the road, pitches move a lot more. So it's a much more difficult hitting environment for the Rockies on the road. And they are usually one of the worst road teams offensively across Major League Baseball. The Pirates are next. The Royals, the Tigers, the Mets, all those teams 283 or lower in Woba, 350 or lower in slugging percentage. Uh, The Pirates are just a bad offense. The Royals, that one surprises me a little bit. I think their offense is a little bit better than that. Tigers, not a great offense. The Mets, you know, they've had a lot of injury issues and all that here so far this season. So none of those teams, a big surprise. The Diamondbacks, Marlins, Phillies, Orioles, and Indians round out the bottom 10 on the road. So again, Diamondbacks, a lot of injuries for them. Marlins, bad offense. Phillies, I don't know what their issue is. Orioles, not a good offense. They don't walk a lot either. And the Indians, their offense just kind of sucks. So the biggest home road splits here, teams that are better at home than on the road. The Rockies obviously top this list. 340 Woba at home, 255 on the road, an 85-point difference for them. So that's quite significant, quite substantial. You have to handicap the Rockies much, much differently at home than you do on the road. And it goes without saying because of Coors Field, but here we're quantifying it. We're 85 points difference between home and road. I mean, that's just a massive split to say the least. Another one here is the Blue Jays. 361 at home, 296 on the road, 65 point difference here for them. And as I said, their home ballpark changes as of Tuesday. So this Toronto offense, which, you know, we already see the home road split dichotomy with their totals in terms of home and road games. We've seen line movements against them on the road simply because of that home road split on offense. This will be a thing going forward here. And also their home numbers probably will drop a little bit at Salem Field. The Reds, 357 at home, 296 on the road. So a 61 point difference for Cincinnati where we've also seen them get bet against on the road as well because of that home road split. So again, with these three teams here, Rockies, Blue Jays, and Reds, you have to handicap them differently at home than you would on the road. The Braves, 348 Woba at home, 301 on the road, 47-point difference there. I do think that they're an offense that gets better on the road as it warms up with their offensive style. 
So I'm not sure I'd put as much weight into this one as I would the other three, but it is worth noting that there is a 47 point difference for the Braves between their home Woba and their road Woba. The Diamondbacks, 40 point difference here, 329 at home, 289 on the road. Again, not much to worry about here until they get healthier on the offensive side, but still they've been better at home at Chase Field with that humidor than they've been on the road. Teams that are better away than at home, we talked about one already here in the Tampa Bay Rays. They are 46 points better in weighted on base average on the road than they are at home. The Mariners, 31 point difference. Again, two very bad home park factors for the Rays and the Mariners. The Twins are 24 points better on the road than at home. I think this one levels off a little bit as it gets warmer at Target Field. The ball does carry a little bit better there. So I think that one will level off to some degree. Rangers, 19 points better on the road than at home. Again, a bad home park factor. The Brewers, 16 points better on the road. I can't really explain that one. Miller Park is is not that bad for offense. I think the Brewers' offense just isn't very good. And then lastly here, the A's, 12 points difference, a 324 on the road, 312 at home. And once again, just not a good home park factor for hitting. So I think these splits are very, very important here for you to keep in mind. And again, you can email me skatingtripods at gmail.com to get on the list here for the betters box notes. And along those same lines, something else to consider here. When you're looking at pitchers and you're breaking down their full season numbers, kind of looking at the game logs and all of that, it is very, very important to consider where they've thrown the majority of their innings. Have they been pitching on the road, you know, where maybe at home, it's a tough place to pitch, but on the road, they're kind of bouncing around, pitching in different environments and all of that. Maybe that's beneficial for a guy. On the flip side, maybe guys have pitched a lot at home and they've got a good home park factor. But when they get out on the road, they're probably going to struggle a little bit. So let's look at a handful of these guys here and kind of break down some of these numbers. For example, Kevin Gaussman for the Giants. He's pitched 64 and two-thirds innings this year, 44.2 road innings, 20 innings at home. So I just talked about it, how Oracle Park is a really good pitcher's park, suppresses power, just a tough place to hit. Gaussman's putting up these ridiculous numbers and doing so where more than two-thirds of his innings pitched have come on the road. So there's a lot of legitimacy to a profile like that. On the flip side, we'll look at somebody at the opposite side of the spectrum, John Means, John Means for the Orioles. Camden Yards, Oriole Park at Camden Yards is a very good offensive park in the summertime. John Means has thrown 47 and two-thirds innings on the road, only 17 and two-thirds innings at home. So regression is coming for Means to begin with, but I'm very much looking for it in his upcoming home starts. Back to the other side here. Or no, actually, let's take a look at this side, same side here. Austin Gomber of the Colorado Rockies. 39 of his innings have been on the road. Only 14.1 innings, 14 and a third at home. So Gomber is a guy, interestingly enough, 554 ERA on the road in his 39 road innings, 188 at home. But he's not pitched much at Coors Field. That's probably three starts at Coors Field out of the nine or 10 that he has here so far. So that's one where I look at Gomber and I say, okay, you're going to have to pitch more at Coors Field as this season goes along. And I don't think it's going to work out for you, dude. So it's important to look at those splits and see where guys have pitched. Have they pitched on the road or have they pitched at home? Tonight, Chris Bassett pitches at home for Oakland. Oakland Coliseum is a bad offensive park. Bassett's got great numbers and 36 and two thirds on the road, 24 and a third at home. I would expect a guy like Bassett to pitch very well at home. And with the numbers he's already putting up this season with the bulk of his innings on the road, then that says to me that this guy and what he's doing is very much legit. So Chris Bassett, a play on guy. And in fact, we've seen that here with the line movement for today's start. Another one here is Trevor Rogers of the Marlins. Only 21 innings at home at Marlins Park. Marlins Park is a great place to pitch. 35 and two thirds on the road for him. And his full season numbers are very, very good. So again, that speaks to the legitimacy of what Rogers is doing And I would anticipate as he gets to make more home starts, he should get better in that department. 
Trevor Bauer here, 49 and two-thirds innings on the road this season, only 20 at home at Dodger Stadium. And in those 20 innings at home, Bauer's only allowed two earned runs. So Bauer's had to pitch a lot on the road, a lot in, you know, unfriendly confines. He's obviously a guy uh, with a lot of personality, doesn't make a lot of friends out there. Hasn't pitched a lot of his innings at home, only 20 innings at home. So that's the thing where Bauer, you know, should see continued success as those things kind of even out a little bit. Mike fulton on the flip side here, 42 and two third or 44 and two thirds innings at home, only 11 innings on the road. And his numbers aren't very good to begin with, but he's thrown four times more innings at home where that ballpark, Globe Life Field, very conducive to pitching, suppresses power in a big way. So Mike fulton whose numbers aren't great to begin with, as he makes more road starts, I would expect him to struggle quite a bit. John Gray, this one's very interesting. 42 innings at home with a 2.36 ERA pitching at Coors Field. 15 and two-thirds on the road has a 6.32 ERA. So Gray is a guy kind of defying a lot of logic here by pitching very well in Denver, not so well on the road in his limited sample size. But I would anticipate his road numbers do get better. He's also a trade candidate here as this season goes along. But along the same lines as fulton here, Adam Wainwright, 41 innings at home, only 13 and two-thirds on the road. Bush Stadium, an excellent pitcher's park. Adam Wainwright is very much in the fade category for me when he makes starts on the road. I think his numbers are inflated by being able to throw so many of his innings at home. So Wainwright, a fade guy on the road. fulton a fade guy on the road. John Means, a fade guy at home. Austin Gomber, potentially, a fade guy at home. So kind of putting together some more of these pitcher profiles based on splits with where their innings pitched have been and keeping those park factors in mind. All of that stuff, very, very important to be sure. And again, if you want the show notes, skatingtripods at gmail.com. Take a look at some line moves here as we go down the line, talk about what's happened throughout the week. We saw Pirates money on both Tuesday and Wednesday here against the Cubs. First, a fade of Jake Arietta. That was with Cody Ponce on the mound. And then on Wednesday, a fade of Trevor Williams with Will Crow on the mound. Cubs did win both of those games, so the money that came in was wrong. But interesting to see some Cubs fades out there. And in particular, Cubs fades without JT Brubaker or Tyler Anderson on the mound. And interestingly enough, Cubs money on Thursday with Kyle Hendricks against Tyler Anderson. So the market has soured on Anderson now, but still likes Brubaker, although a tough last start for him. So we'll see what he does coming up here this weekend. Very, very heavy move on Max Scherzer and the Nationals on Tuesday against Tyler Mayo and the Cincinnati Reds. About a 60-cent line move here in this one. And again, I think part of this has to do with exactly what I just talked about, where the offensive projection for the Reds on the road is dramatically lower than it is at home. And when you put a guy like Max Scherzer out there, that lowers that projection even more. So look for Reds money at home and Reds fades on the road. I think that's what we see as we go forward here. And I would follow that as well with some of these other teams that have those big home road splits. A little bit of money against Tarek Skubal and the Tigers. That was Aaron Savale and the Indians on Tuesday. Not to the same degree. Skubal's changed his arsenal a little bit. He's kind of changed his repertoire pitching a little bit better here recently. So maybe the market kind of picks up on that, won't fade Scooble as hard. Either that or they just don't believe in the Indians' offense, and and who can blame them for that? So money on Tuesday on Rich Hill and the Tampa Bay Rays, quite significant money at that on Hill and the Rays, taking on the Royals and Brad Keller. Royals, a two-to-one winner in that one. So a lot of money, a lot of steam on the Rays coming up on the wrong end there on Tuesday. And again, keep in mind, Both of the games in this Rays-Royals series so far have been two-to-one games. And Tropicana Field, just not a good ballpark for offense. And what that will do is that will give underdogs a better chance with a lower-scoring run environment. Saw heavy Andrew Heaney and Los Angeles Angels money on Tuesday against the Rangers and Hyung Jun Yang. Uh, Yang, of course, a guy who comes over from the KBO. Uh, You know, the Rangers are a fade team to me. I, I don't really like them a whole lot. Did lose money on them yesterday for the first five with Dane Dunning, but the Angels saw a lot of money on Tuesday. It was a different story on Wednesday as that line saw a flipped favorite where the Rangers became the favorite 
with Dane Dunning against Griffin Canning. Angels won that game. It wasn't easy. They nearly blew a big lead, uh, but that was one where money did come in on Dane Dunning in that game against the Angels and Griffin Canning. Back to Tuesday, though, real quickly. Money on the Astros and Zach Granke against the Dodgers. But then on Wednesday, we saw a very big Dodgers line move where they closed up in the minus 160s with Trevor Bauer against Luis Garcia. So the market's moving around quite a bit right now, being very, very fickle, to say the least, as they're kind of you know going back and forth, playing on some teams, fading some teams, all that kind of thing. Tough to kind of get a profile, but as you start looking at a lot of these things, home road splits, pitchers they don't like, stuff like that, you can kind of figure out where these lines are going to go. Saw Diamondbacks money on Tuesday, Wednesday, and also on Thursday here. Uh, they are getting a little bit healthier in the lineup. Can tell Marte is back. Carson Kelly is back. But I'm still not putting a whole lot of stock in the Diamondbacks right now. And in fact, did fade them here uh, for Thursday's game. That's Carlos Martinez and Matt Peacock. On Wednesday, we also saw big White Sox money. John Gant and Carlos Rodon in that one. A lot of big fades of John Gant lately. A lot of fades of guys with high walk rates. We're seeing money against Shohei Otani on Thursday. A lot of fades of guys with big walk rates. And John Gant is a guy with a big walk rate here for this season. Pretty sizable move on Nick Pavetta and the Red Sox against Drew Smiley and the Braves. Uh, The Braves with that big home road split on offense. But a big part of this game, just simply a fade of Drew Smiley. And the Red Sox did hang a big number and come away with the win in that one. Thursday, as I mentioned already, the Cubs have taken money. That's Kyle Hendricks against Tyler Anderson. A fade of the Cardinals, as I mentioned as well, with Carlos Martinez and Matt Peacock. The fade of Otani and his high walk rate with the A's and the Angels in that one. Chris Bassett making that home start. Surprising to see you know, the A's up to the minus 150 range against Otani, but you know a lot of respected money speaking loudly on that one. Seeing some Brewers money today, Adrian Hauser against Ryan Weathers for the Padres. That's a fade of Ryan Weathers. Very low BABIP, high left on base percentage, low strikeout percentage. On the market, expecting him to kind of regress a little bit. Uh, Seeing some Rays money on Shane McClanahan. That's against Brady Singer. I played the under 7.5 in that one. But seeing some Rays line movement there in that one. A lot of people like McClanahan. In fact, he's been steamed quite a few times here over his last few starts. Uh, But as far as a pick for tonight's action, played the White Sox run line tonight. Uh, Just kind of a very simple handicap. They're facing a left-handed starter. Dylan Cease facing the Orioles, who've lost 10 in a row and 16 of 18, I think. So just went ahead and played the run line there in that one. Uh, Do kind of lean Yankees in game two. Robbie Ray, Jordan Montgomery. But we'll see what happens there in game one. Taking a look at the weekend here. We start with that Cardinals-Diamondbacks series. Carlos Martinez, Matt Peacock tonight. Johan Oviedo, Madison Bumgarner on Saturday, or Friday, excuse me. Adam Wainwright and to be determined on Saturday. We'll look to fade Wainwright, whether that's a Diamondbacks team total over, taking a play on the Diamondbacks, depending on who's starting, uh, maybe the over in that game, something like that. We'll look to fade Wainwright in his Saturday start. And then Quang Hyung Kim and uh, Corbin Martin coming up here on Sunday. Diamondbacks have been taking money. You know, line moves on the Diamondbacks have been frequent here so far this week. A lot of money coming in against the Cardinals. I think fading the Cardinals on the road without the safety net of Bush Stadium is something that people want to do. I'd watch the odds in this one. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Diamondbacks money in all four of these games, depending on who gets that start on Saturday against Wainwright. Arizona could take money in all four of these games here. So if you like the Cardinals, wait it out. If you like Arizona, go ahead and jump in that pool. Giants and Dodgers. Alex Wood in a bullpen game tonight for the Giants and Dodgers in game one of that series. Anthony DiScofani, Walker Bueller Friday, Logan Webb, Julio Urias Saturday, and then Kevin Gaussman and Clayton Kershaw on Sunday. Giants got swept at home last week. How will they fare here in this one? Time will tell, but the Dodgers are playing very, very well right now. And the Giants did handle their affairs against the Diamondbacks, so I give them credit for that. Bouncing back here early on in this week. But, you know, as I kind of look at this series, like the under a little bit and Webb and Urias on Saturday, but that'll be a low total of probably seven. That'll be kind of a tough one to come by. Do like Logan Webb. Uh, If that line is big enough, I'll consider it. But also Urias 
pitching about as well as anybody on the planet this season. He's been very, very good. And the Dodgers have stretched him out a little bit. So uh, kudos to him for that. Kevin Gaussman's pitched very well. Uh, That's a big number on Sunday, maybe a possibility there. But I just don't know if we're going to get a whole lot of betting value out of this Giants and Dodgers series. Padres and Astros. Dinelson Lamott and Framber Valdez makes his return on Friday. Hugh Darvish and Jake Odorizzi also off the IL on Saturday. Blake Snell, Zach Granke on Sunday. Look, this is a really big ask for Valdez and Odorizzi. Coming off the IL, facing the Padres. Uh, you know, we'll see if the park is open for these games. If it is, you know, good offensive numbers are a possibility for both of these teams. The Padres have the bullpen advantage here in this series. So that's something you got to consider as well. Two good offenses should be a good series both ways. But something that's really interesting about Houston is that low strikeout rate. You know, Darvish on Saturday, a guy that racks up a lot of Ks. Blake Snell, lots of strikeouts, lots of walks. Astros, a very aggressive profile offensively. What happens with Darvish and Snell on Saturday and Sunday here? We could have some overs, despite the talent of the pitching in this series. We could have some overs here. So I'm going to see what those numbers look like and kind of go from there. The Blue Jays and the Indians open a weekend set in Cleveland. Hunjin Ryu and Eli Morgan making his major league debut for the Indians on Friday. Ross Stripling and Sam Hentges Saturday. I wouldn't be surprised if we see openers in both of those starts. And then Steven Matz and Aaron Savale coming up here on Sunday. The Indians are down to two starting pitchers. They've got a double header with the White Sox on Monday that starts a four-game series. It's a very tough spot for Cleveland here this weekend. The offense is bad. The pitching staff is kind of a mess. But at the same time, as we talked about already, Toronto is not performing offensively on the road. And now Toronto has packed up everything with them because they start in Buffalo on Tuesday. So a really weird series here for both teams. I'll be curious to see how this is priced. I think the Blue Jays will be a road favorite on Friday with Ryu against Morgan. Uh, Eli Morgan, kind of a pitch-to-contact type of guy, uh, Plesak-esque sort of in that regard. So we'll see what his first start kind of looks like. But, you know, uh, it's going to be kind of cold, kind of ugly in Cleveland this weekend. Uh, Sunday looks a little bit better. Friday's game could very well be rained out, which would mean another doubleheader for the Blue Jays if Friday's game is rained out. So that's something you want to consider. A weird series for both teams, but a lot of things that I wanted to have uh, on your radar here as we head into the weekend. Lastly, the Braves and the Mets. Ian Anderson to be determined on Friday. Max Freed and David Peterson Saturday. Charlie Morton and Jacob deGrom in a very good one here on Sunday. But the reason I want to talk about this series is because it's Sunday night baseball. The Mets go to Arizona to play a game, I believe it's 7-10 local time. So long, late travel for New York out to the desert. Arizona does not have a starter name for that one as of yet. But that could be a good fade spot of the Mets. And the Braves host the Nationals, and they'll play at 5-10. So they'll get home late Sunday night, early Monday morning, then have to turn around and play the Nationals at 5-10 there on Monday. So a lot of day games with the Monday holiday, but both of these teams in very difficult situational spots for Monday could see myself having a fade play against both the Braves and the Mets for Memorial Day Baseball. Talking about a lot of stuff here on today's show, as I always do, Skating tripods at gmail.com for the show notes if you want to get them. And as I said, every intention of doing a show here on Monday, even with the Memorial Day holiday. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And remember that you will never strike out when you're in the betters box.